Amen. Well, good morning, Trey Mark. So good to be here and hang out with you to your wonderful pastor, to Pastor Landon and Brittany, to your great staff, to Pastor Elliot. I appreciate this opportunity to stand. I appreciate even more just the Pickering family and their friendship. Um, uh, as it, they didn't know, but when I met them four years ago now, four years ago, uh, I was probably in one of the worst seasons of my life questioning if I would ever preach or pastor again. And I'm just grateful for their friendship, um, their authenticity, and everything that they have given and poured into the life of my family and my church and all of those things. I'm grateful for you, Trey, Mark, just for letting your pastor rest. Um, I am a Mac guy. I'm an Apple guy. I'm saved. You robots. <laughs> I'm praying for you robots, but uh, I, I, I have it all. I got the iPhone, the watch, the iPad, all of the things. My MacBook, I was using it uh, actually a few months ago. Uh, it started crashing on me, I guess. I mean, it was doing something. It would shut off on me all of the time. I was freaking out. I thought I would lose something. I'd always have to restart it in the windows. Do you want to recover this document? I was getting nervous uh, because I'm uh, in an academic program. I don't need to be losing papers and all of those things. So I went to the Genius Bar. And I sat there with the guy and he said, hey, how often do you use your Mac? I was like, every day, what do you mean? It's a computer. He was like, he was like all right, how, how many hours a day? I was like, it don't shut off. Like, it, it's my computer. He said, oh, we would consider you a professional user and all of these things. Thanks for the compliment. Fix this though. Like, this is a problem. He's going through it. He can't really find anything wrong. Finally, he gets to this one part of the computer. He says, hey, when's the last time you shut your computer down? I said, what is that? I said, I closed the book. It's a MacBook. You close it. It's good. He said, no, 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 no. Like, actually hit the little apple and shut it down. I said, I don't, I don't know. I, maybe I'll hit sleep every now and then. I don't shut it down. He says, I said, what's the problem? He said, you don't realize every time you close that book, he said, it is designed in a way that it is still working in the background trying to keep all of those tabs and windows and programs open to keep everything running. He said, so even though it says sleep, it's still working. And he says, if you would just shut it down once a week, it would change everything. Literally, y'all, he cleared my cash, whatever this stuff is, you techie people know. He cleared all of my stuff. He literally shut it down. That's it. Two seconds later, he restarted it. My Mac has worked perfectly since. Thank you for letting your pastor shut it down. Amen. Uh, as he said, I am the pastor of Rising Star Church in Southeast Fort Worth. Uh, I had the wonderful privilege of succeeding my father. Our church this year in two months will be 93 years old. It'll be 93 years old. My father, he was only the third pastor. I'm only the fourth pastor in 93 years. It's an incredible story. Um, and I succeeded my father. He pastored 33 years, 33 years. And he handed me the baton uh, last year. And so it has just been a work and a privilege for us. Just so grateful for the partnership, contribution, the love of Trademark um, in this season for us. I'm exceptionally excited for this service because my favorite person in the world is here, my bride. My bride is here. Yes. That's my baby mama right there. But we would have been married on 15 years this August. 15 years. I'm just so grateful to have her here with me. All right. I have an assignment today. So are we ready for a word? Good, I believe that God has something impactful to say to us today, found in the Gospel of John. So tap or turn, if you're an old school paper Bible, get there. John, tap or turn. John chapter 2, and uh, I can't preach without my Bible, so leave it open. John chapter 2. I want to read one verse in your hearing to set the stage for what we will communicate today. Uh, but the core, what we will talk about, will be several verses for context. We'll deal with about 10 verses or such. But I want to read one, one verse that I think will set the stage for us. John chapter 2, verse 5. I'm going to read the New International Version. If you have something different, I promise you'll be able to follow along just the same. John 2, 5 says this. His mother, meaning Jesus' mother, his mother said to the servants, 
do whatever he tells you. I'm going to say it again. That's all we're going to read. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I want to tag this text with this title, Just Do It. Just do it. Uh, my beautiful bride has graced me with two wonderful kids. One is 21, pray. One is 21. The other one is 11. And that 11-year-old is something else. She is very literal, very brilliant. Her mind works in a certain way. The problem is, though, because she's smart she, and because she's who she is, she's very argumentative. What doesn't help, though, is also she is very literal. You can't say much of anything to her. She is very literal, very straightforward, very practical. So the problem with that is that uh, my wife and her have heated conversations often. That's what we're going to call it. Heated conversations. And she's trying to get her to do some things, whatever the case may be, clean her room or take a shower, or put her hair up, wash the dish, whatever the case may be. And she's kind of arguing and my wife will get irritated. And all of a sudden, these idioms and this slang will start to come out. But my daughter is literal. So, so my wife will say stuff like, you know, a hard head makes for a soft behind. And my daughter would be like, how is the head hard? How is the cranium connected to the glue? Hey, we didn't ask you all of that, right? They're talking. My, my daughter's voice is elevated. She might say, listen, you jump up, you'll get knocked back down. And my, she, I didn't jump, mommy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't jump. She'd get real, real, real country. My wife's family is from East Texas. And so she'll get real country. Say, listen, you'll find out fat meat is greasy. And my daughter would say, what is fat meat? And where did it come from and why? And finally, we have to look at her and say, listen to me, child. Just do what we told you. Just do whatever we said do. Sit up in your seat, trademark. Because listen, what we had to get her to understand is that doing is not attached to understanding. It's attached to obedience. Can I suggest to you then, family, that we need to make up in our minds to just do some things. We have to be careful that we are hesitant or argumentative with Jesus and we don't do what he's asking us to do and we find ourselves paralyzed. We find ourselves first paralyzed because we want clarity. We, we, we have a lack of clarity, so now we don't do what he says. You, you know what I mean. We want to see the end before we start from the beginning. I, I got to see everything, how it's going to pan out, what it's going to look like before I take a step. You know how we are. I'm not going to move till I get a period instead of a question mark. And what we don't realize is that sometimes God will leave you in those question mark seasons to find out if you'll trust him and do what he's asked you to do. Maybe for some of us it isn't clarity. Maybe we're paralyzed because we lack control. You, you, you know, we want to we wanna hold it to see if we can handle it. We, we want to test it out because don't let it seem too difficult. Now nah, I don't want to do anything. Don't let it seem like it's going to make me uncomfortable. Now I don't want to do anything. You know, this might be a little hard, so I'm out. You, you mean like I actually have to study? Oh, then I'm out. You, you mean like I actually have to sacrifice something? Then I'm out. You mean like I actually have to get on Instagram and TikTok? Oh, then I'm out. And so then we, we struggle to do what God has called us to. Here it is. The problem is we like to call ourselves people of faith, but we live as people of facts. This is why you trust celebrities and Instagram personalities and all these people on TikTok with your relationships other than God. Because you rather have a recommendation from people you can see than a revelation from God that you can't see. You got to be careful of that. And I'm going to tell you why, how you don't need to see it. Because removing the mystery often reduces the magnificence. That God doesn't have to show you everything for you to trust him. The mystery of who God is, the mystery of what he's calling us to should push me to what has yet to be revealed. 
because, hear me well, that in order for me to be who God has designed for me to be, in order for you to be who God has called you to be individually and collectively as a church is going to require the necessity to do some things despite the mystery. But you've got to lean in to that mystery. That's really what our text is about. The Gospel of John is written because he wants to deal with the mystery. Let me help you. John, uh, when he wrote his gospel, it is the last gospel written. It is recorded in the hundreds A.D. Mark is written in 70 A.D., then Matthew comes, then Luke. Several years later, John pens his gospel. Why? John thought everything was good, but in his time, all of these cultic practices had popped up. That wasn't new. All of these false religions, that wasn't new either. The problem was they were specifically antagonizing followers of the way. They, they were specifically attacking the theology and the ideas of what it meant to be a Christian. And so he says, no, 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 I've got to deal with this. And here were the two biggest issues that were oppressing them in that time. The denial of the deity of Jesus and the denial of the necessity of Jesus. Meaning they wanted to say that Jesus was not God. And they also wanted to say that you didn't need Jesus to be reconciled to the Father. And John says, no, let me fix it right now. And he pens this gospel and he opens with some of the most eloquent words. John echoes Genesis. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. When you get to verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us. He gives us the foundation of what scholars and theologians would later call, write it down. Here you go. The homo usias. Homo usias, $10 word, sounds smart when you go to brunch later. The homo usias, $10 word, here's the two cent meaning. It means same substance. That John is making sure they understand that no, 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 when we're looking at this deity, this godness, that the Father and the Son are the same, that Jesus is 100% God, and yet he was 100% human. How? Here it is. It's a mystery. You have to embrace the mystery. Why, trademark? You have to embrace the mystery of God who is above you so that he can be God for you and do what he wants to do through you. Press pause, rewind. Let me say that again. You got to embrace the mystery of God who is above you so that he can be God for you and do what he wants to do through you. So here it is. He sets this up. He explains who Jesus is. He then puts Jesus on the scene. Jesus then calls his disciples. And then when we turn to chapter two, the very first thing that happens is Jesus is at a wedding in Cana. Jesus is at a party. In case you didn't know, Jesus likes to party. No, no, you need to understand. Hebrew weddings is way turned up, way more than your wedding ever was. They party for weeks at a time, right? So this is, this is a party that he's, he's jigging two hops this time. In my imagination, Jesus is like my age generation. When we used to be at a party, he got his foot on the wall. He's just chilling because they don't dance no more. All they do is this. And he's having a good time, and here we are. He's at a wedding. He's minding his own business. He's got to have a reason to be there. Weddings typically were connected to the family or the tribe or the clan, so a large group would be there. And all of a sudden, the Scripture tells us they have run out of wine. Mary, his mother, runs to Jesus. She says, Jesus, they run out of wine. Here's what the Scripture doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us how she knows they ran out of wine. It doesn't say she's a part of the people who are handling it. It doesn't call her the head servant, or it doesn't say what if she's connected to the bride or the bridegroom. Please understand what I just said. Somehow, she knows they have run out of wine, and she comes to Jesus. I need to say it again. Somehow, she knows they have run out of wine, and her first instinct is to go to Jesus. If you run out of wine at a wedding, this is a big deal. They can stone you for running out of wine at a wedding 
because it assumes that you don't have the ability to take care of the bride that you have. You don't run out of wine at a wedding and they run into this problem and Mary's first instinct is to run to Jesus. I need you to sit in that because I need you to realize you need to know who to go to when trouble shows up. Mary doesn't run to the corner store. She doesn't find an H-E-B or a Walmart or a Kroger. She doesn't get the old wine skins and cry out and beg. She doesn't knock or go borrow from another family. She knows if there's trouble, I run to Jesus. If there's a problem, I go to Jesus. If I'm hurting, I get to Jesus. And she runs to him to tell him. And Jesus' response is he says, Mary, why do you involve me? He literally says this. He literally says, woman, why do you involve me? Okay, y'all. I have a very old school black mother. Had I said, whoa, whoa I, I wouldn't have got to man. It would have been, whoa, all my front teeth would have been right there. All of them. <laughs> Jesus says, woman. Now, now, to be accurate to the language, when he says woman, it really means more miss or ma'am. So I still think he's a little petty, though. So he's like, ma'am, why do you involve me? Right? Because this is what his problem was. He knows it is not yet his time. And this is what I love about Mary, though, that Mary does not respond to Jesus. She turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. I love this. This moment is significant because Mary's instructions show us that she understood that Jesus would handle it. She just didn't know how he would handle it. Her language says she believed that she knew that Jesus was able to do what needed to be done. She didn't know how, but she trusted that he will. Can I encourage you today, trademark, that you serve a God that can handle everything that concerns you, and you've got to have the kind of faith and fortitude and confidence and courage to say no matter how big or small or how long it feels like it's taking, Jesus can handle everything that concerns you. You may not know how he's going to do it. You may not know when he's going to do it. You may not know where the answer is going to come from, but please be encouraged that Jesus will fix it, that Jesus will handle it. We need to learn to be like Mary in that way because she, she says something that, in my opinion, sums up the entirety of the Christian walk. A trademark, if you are going to be the church, if you're going to be everything the church is, her one line sums up what it looks like. This is what she says, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever Jesus tells you. I hope you hear what I said. She didn't say do it if you like it. She didn't say do it if it makes you comfortable. She didn't say do it if it feels good. She didn't say do it if it was going to earn you a certain amount of income. She said, nope, do whatever he tells you. I suggest that as we walk through this text, there are four things that Jesus asks us to do. Here it is. Number one, Jesus tells them, he shows them that they need to address their participation. That's what I'll say to you. Address your participation. You need to address your participation. Historically, chronologically, this is Jesus' first miracle, first sign. The timeline maps John's gospel out before Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The miracle, simply this, required Mary to come to Jesus. Then Jesus to instruct the servants and the servants to do what Jesus said. Let me work that again. Mary comes to Jesus. Jesus talks to the servants, and then the servants have to do what Jesus says. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand, that the miracle was attached to obedience. That the problem that was presented could only be solved by the participation of the people. It's right there in the text. Look at John chapter 2, verse 7. John chapter 2, watch what it says. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Don't run past that first part. Jesus said to the servants. 
Let's, let me see if I can help you understand it. I, I uh, grew up watching old school cartoons. My sister is 12 years older than me. My brother, rest in peace, was 16 years uh, older than me. And so I'm the, you know, the oops, the uh-oh, right? I, I'm the late baby. And, and so we would sit and we would watch cartoons. And I would love this because they love the Flintstones and the Jetsons. I'm a Jetsons kid. I love the Jetsons with Elroy and Astro and George and Judy. And so I would love how they would walk up to the machine and just press the button and boom, there was coffee. They could just say something and a full hot meal would show up. George would get ready to work by standing in front of conveyor belt. It'd pick him up, carry him, dress him, brush his teeth, bathe him, wash him. I am still waiting on that day now. I loved it. He didn't have to do anything. It was all done for him. This is what I'm trying to get you to see, that this isn't that. The servants actually had to participate. This miracle was not accomplished without the servants getting involved. Jesus didn't just say, wine, and wine appeared. He didn't just wave his hand over the room. Hear me, the servants actually had to serve. Newsflash, here it is. Write it down. Theological breakthrough. Here we go. Did you know that servants actually have to serve? That they actually have to serve? They actually have to do what is required of them? Who they were receiving direction from changed. They're not receiving direction from the head waiter. They're not receiving direction from the master. But listen, their responsibility to serve did not change, y'all. Here it is. Don't throw stones. I'm just a messenger. But maybe our issue is not that our problems are too hard. Maybe our issue is that our participation is too weak. Maybe the issue is not our ability. Maybe our issue is our availability. Because ministry and miracles and scripture required participation, y'all. Jesus looked at the lame man and told him to take up his mat, get up and walk. He looked at the blind man and told him to wash in the pool of Siloam. Y'all, even in 1 Kings 17, when Elijah is at the Kareth Brook Ravine and he's hungry, the Lord instructs the ravens to feed him by day and by night. That means even the birds are obeyed God's command. If the ravens can obey, can we? We have to serve. Servants have to serve. Can I challenge your work ethic for a minute that what God promised you, what God promised in his word isn't just going to fall out of the sky. You have to do something. I know you need a financial breakthrough. So the question is, when are you going to budget and stick to it? I know you need some professional advancement. So when are you going to update your resume and go back to school or take a class? When are you going to get off of somebody else's Instagram page and stop comparing and complaining and start contributing to the gifts and the call and the life that God has given you? I know you are struggling. So when is the last time you prayed and fasted? I know you got some health concerns, so when's the last time you worked out? And I don't mean walk to the fridge and back. You've got to do something, family. When was the last time you walked in relationship with somebody else? When was the last time you shared your testimony? I didn't say you had to memorize Leviticus, but you ought to be able to tell somebody what God has done for you. As servants have to serve, you have to address your participation. Here's the second thing that Jesus encourages us with. He tells us to assess your pots. Assess your pots. Let's look at the Bible. John chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Nearby stood six stone water pots, water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Out of everything that he says, Jesus instructs them to get the pot. Servants, go grab them ceremonial washing jars. Come on, y'all. If we interrogate the narrative, we need to ask some questions here. 
Why the pots? Why, why the jars? I mean, why not ask for the empty wineskins? Why, why not ask for new wineskins and then just multiply it the way you were going to do fish and bread later or how you did with the oil with the widow woman in the Old Testament? Why not just wave your hand? Why ceremonial washing pots? This is why. Let's take some time here and unpack it. This is why. Because Jesus wants us to assess first what is sitting. Why assess our pots? Because the pots are just sitting. Here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. What is available in your life that is just sitting? What is available in your life that is not being used at maximum capacity? What is just lying dormant in you or laying around you that could be used? The jars had a purpose and the jars had served their function. And Jesus is exposing here that he can take jars that were simply meant for washing and also use them for wine. Here's my point, that so many of us are just sitting on gifts and talents and relationships that could be used, not realizing that what we have is enough, that we keep waiting on God to send something extra, and God is like, no, with me, all you have is all you need, and that if we could start using what we have, God can open up the door to new possibilities, that while you're waiting on the next one, you Use the job that you have. That I know you want to make content and film and TV production. Use the iPhone camera that you have. I need you to use the resources that you have. That you want to open a restaurant and a food truck, then use the oven that you have. Use what you have. It's just sitting there. And the Lord is like, I know you already used it for washing, but I can also use it for wine. Not only is the pots, why assess our pots? Our pots are just sitting. Here's what else the text unveils to us, that the pots are also considered sacred. So he wants us to assess what is sacred. Here it is. The jars carried water for ceremonial washing. That's key. Not just washing, ceremonial washing. This was a big deal. And so the jars were for a ceremony of hand washing before and after meals. This was a big deal where the Pharisees will later argue with Jesus over the fact that his disciples don't always wash their hands. Because it was a ceremony. It was sacred. For them, it was sacred duty to pour water over hands. And now you want to use the ceremonial pots for wine? Ceremonial water pots? For celebratory wine, what in the world? Because what Jesus is exposing is that the washing is sanitary, not sacred. It's sanitary, not sacred. In other words, there is nothing special about the jar. What is special is their joy. Wine in the New Testament represents joy, y'all. It represents the joy of the Spirit of God. And for them to have run out of wine meant they were running out of joy. What pain to be sad at a wedding reception. They were running out of joy. And he's like, forget the ceremony with the hand washing. These people need joy. And he is going to now use what they think is sacred. Hear me, y'all, that he can repurpose what they considered sacred in order to give them success. Ask yourself then, what do you consider sacred that you need to give back to God? What do you consider sacred? What are you holding on to that you actually need to let go of? What has become sacred to me that it is actually causing stress for me? Oh, come on, y'all. You know what I mean by sacred. Don't touch it. Don't move it. Don't change it. Don't challenge it. Oh, you, you know, I've always been this way. This is who my family is. This is just how I grew up. This is just how we talk. This is just how I do it. But that doesn't mean how you do it is how it should be done. 
Sacred is always saying, we've done it this way, or why do things have to change? And the Lord is like, if you would assess what you're calling sacred, I can provide you success in an area that you didn't even realize was possible. You got to assess those pots, though, because they're sitting, they're sacred, and here's the other one. They're also what is soiled. But you need to assess what is soiled. You need to assess what is dirty. The jars are for washing, y'all. They are for cleansing dirt. Clean water potentially turns into dirty water in these jars. You got to realize these jars are moved, used for ceremonial hand washing. You got six stone water pots. They're large. Think of a large washing basin. And you got to imagine these strong men who would come and they would stick their hands in the water and they would wash. Eventually, they would pick up a pot. They could pour water over hands and then it would go in one pot. They would exchange this water and dip their hands in the water. So all of the dust and the grime and the dirt and the filth of the first century is going into this water. And this is what he wants to use for wine. That's nasty, fam. That's nasty. It's dirty. These are stone water pots. Y'all, the only way to cleanse them is you have to set them on fire. You have to scourge them. You got to heat them into a point to kill everything that's there. There's no fire. They too busy turning up. They two hops this time. Slide, you know. They jam and they don't have time for this. And now he wants them to use what they use for dirt. He wants to take dirty stuff and give them a miracle. He wants to take filthy stuff and give them a miracle. This is not for the people in here who think they're perfect, but for the rest of us who know we're dirty. For the rest of us who know we made some mistakes and messed up and that we are filthy and feeble and fickle and fallible, I have good news for you today, trademark. Jesus still uses dirty stuff. Jesus still uses dirty stuff that he takes these dirty jars and he uses them and he uses this messy material for a miracle. Here's what challenges me though, that God can't use what I won't give him. God can't use what I won't make available. And I know in this social media age, let me make sure I'm clear for you, YouTube me and get me canceled. I'm not telling you to be flamboyant with your sin. I'm not telling you your sin is okay. What I am telling you, though, is that if you would bring your mess to God, that God can assess your mess, he will address your mess, and he will use it for ministry. That he will assess it, he will address it, and he will use it. How do you know that? I got Bible, ask Rahab. Read Joshua chapter 5 and Joshua chapter 6. The children of Israel have pulled up to the promised land. They have already crossed the Jordan River. They're staring at Jericho, which would have been a military outpost. It is built up and surrounded by a wall, and Rahab owns a brothel in the wall of this military citadel. It's not a large town. It's mostly soldiers there, but Rahab, who is a prostitute running a brothel, provides a service to the soldiers. And now these spies have come to check out the land and they find themselves in Rahab's house and a conversation ensues where she says, no, nope, it ain't going down like that. I know who you are. I know what the Lord has done. I want you to save me too. She hides the spies in the house, the same place that she would use for sin. She gave them safety. She decides to hide a scarlet cord outside of the window. The spies go back. If you graduated from Sunday school, you know the story. They march, they shout, walls fall. But if you keep reading the story, they go find Rahab and her family. And as a gift, one of the spies marries her. His name is Salmon. Why is that important? Because Rahab and Salmon have a son. His name is Boaz. And Boaz marries Ruth, and they have a son. His name is Obed. And Obed has a son. His name is Jesse. And then Jesse has a son, and his name is King David. And if you read your Bible long enough, you find out that King David has a great, 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 great grandson, and his name is Jesus. And I need you to understand that because Rahab was willing to give away her mess, God turned a prostitute into a princess. Because you wants you to assess what you have that is soil. Here's the third thing he wants you to do. He wants you to attach your people. 
It wants you to attach your people. John chapter two, verse eight, the text says this. Then he told them, let me say it again. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. When Jesus gives the instructions, the servants get to work. Please notice that it takes servants to do this. It takes servants, plural, to get this accomplished. Because what he does is he instructs them to fill up these stone jars that were either partially or entirely empty by this point. And he tells them to fill them up with water. Here we go. Let me nerd out for a second. These stone pots, the way they were, their density, their size would be approximately 200 to 300 pounds each. Think about what I just said. Six of them, 300 pounds. Let's do some math. That's 1,800 pounds. I don't care how much you bench, bro. That's heavy. That's heavy, right? 1,800 pounds that they have of weight that they need to carry. That means that the jars are too heavy to carry by themselves. That it needed to be multiple servants to carry these pots. The jars are too much for one person. Can I tell you something, Trademark? That what you are dealing with is too heavy to carry by yourself. This life that you are living is too heavy to carry by yourself. You need to get some people you are connected to because good connection creates greater acceleration. Where are your people? Where are the people who will affirm you and hold you accountable? Where are the people who will call you out and build you up? You need to attach your people. And when they attach their people, this row of servants sticks this beam between the bars and they pick up these pots. They carry them to the head waiter. Notice they never drink the water first. They don't dip in and see what it's like first. They just take it to the head waiter as though they're bringing refills to the drinks. The music is loud. What'd you say? We got some more wine. They bring the wine and they let him serve it without any knowledge or credit of what is happening, but they let him be a part of the miracle. Did you hear what I just said? That they are participating in it. They could have easily said, yeah, we filled these pots up. We carried them. Or they could have said, man, there's this dude back here. He's doing these magic tricks. Nope. They bring it and they let him serve it and they watch God do something for other people without trying to take credit for themselves. Because can I tell you something? That God often wants to do something through you, not just to you. That if he can get it to you, that he also wants to get it through you. And this is why you have to attach your people. So you need to address your participation. You need to assess your pots. Attach your people. And finally, I believe the text tells us to just amaze at his presence to just be amazed at his presence. John chapter two, verse 10, the text says this, and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests had too much to drink. Watch what he says, but you have saved the best till now. When the head waiter, the master servant, tastes the wine, y'all, he's blown away. He's amazed. He's like, no one does this. No one puts out the good stuff last. No one puts out the good stuff at the end of the banquet. Are you kidding me? You get them tipsy and warm first. Then you give them the watered down stuff so that it would just maintain their buzz. Don't ask me how I know. But this is what he knows, that man, you gave them the best at the end. What great hospitality. What in the world that you would save the best for last. And I came to give you some hope today, Trademark, that Jesus saves the best for last. That regardless of what you're facing today, regardless of what you went through on yesterday, please be encouraged that Jesus saves the best for last. If your heart has been broken relationally, Jesus still saves the best for last. No matter what you're dealing with personally, Jesus saves the best for last. Even of what we could say is eschatologically, meaning there shall be a day when the sky cracks. 
and Jesus shall appear on a horse triumphant to restore and to renew and to change everything, to wipe every tear away and to dry your eye that regardless if you're worth five cent or five billion, that it will not compare because Jesus saves the best for last. He saves the best for last, and when he does it, they just marvel at the miracle. They are just amazed. No one lets the cat out of the bag. No one discloses how this is done. They just marvel at the magnificence of Jesus. You got to understand, if you're a servant and you watch water go to wine in a dirty pot and they celebrate it, nobody runs back to Jesus and says, hey, now about my mama, will you heal her? Nobody runs back and says, hey, now about my money or, or my job or my master. They watch it happen and they are simply amazed. They are just marveling at the magnificence of Jesus. And here's my point. This was a moment not for request. It was a moment of respect. Worship team, you can come. I, I, I love my daughter, her crazy self. And I never forget a few days ago, sitting on the couch, she, she comes downstairs, she walks around to me and she sits on my lap, she puts her head on my chest and she, you know, she does her little thing. And if you're a parent in here, you already know what I said, what you want, what you want. She said, nothing, daddy, nothing, I don't, I don't, I don't want anything. She sat there, she curled up a little bit more. She grabbed the remote. She said, Dad, Daddy, you want to watch Law & Order? I know you love Law & Order. Okay, babe. She changes the channel. I say, you sure you want to watch this a little? No, 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 Daddy, let's watch Law & Order. Then I say, okay, for real. <laughs> what do you want? No, nothing, Daddy, I'm good. Dad, uh, uh, do you want some of my goldfish? No, the no, answer is no, because you're working way too hard right now. Finally, she sits up, she looks at me, and she says, Daddy, I don't want anything. I just wanted to sit with you today. When she said it, my wallet somehow magically slid out of my pocket. <laughs> my checking account number, routing number. Because here, here's what I know, here's what I know. That the fact that she just wanted Daddy made me want to give her everything. Here's what I'm trying to get you to get, Trademark. You got to learn how to just want daddy. You got to look at the master and say, Lord, I don't need anything else. I don't want anything else. But in this moment, I just want you. Songwriter says, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I just want to be with you. Nothing else. I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything. I just want you. And we would learn how to amaze at his presence that Jesus is here for you today. And he is saying that if you come to me and sit at my feet, I can do more for you than you ever thought possible. If you would just do whatever I tell you to do. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for these here, your children and your people. Bless them indeed. Enlarge their territory. Keep your hand upon them. Help them not to cause harm. Remind them that your presence is where we want to be and that whatever you ask us to do, whether it is uncomfortable or difficult, whether we have clarity or control or not, that we would surrender and submit ourselves to you because we know with you, all things are possible. With you, all things can be made new. So God, we love you today. Help us to address our participation, to assess our pots, to attach our people, and to amaze at your presence. Jesus' name.